Life Series book. I didn't have it. So I snagged that, flipped it open, and I'll be damned, I turned right to the page where I found a photograph from the Civil War here on Charter Street. Okay, your story takes place here at the Provincial Hotel. Please understand that building was not in the photo. It came on much later. The focus of this photo was on the bodies on the sidewalk crossroad. Now the Civil War is still on record as being the most brutal war we've ever gone through for two reasons. One, just entered the Industrial Revolution. A lot of people forget how important that is, but you remember this is the first time in history we cease to make everything one at a time by hand. Take the muskets, for example. When you were done forging the musket barrel, you would then take a series of dummy bullets, insert them in the barrel. You're trying to figure out what caliber you just made. You couldn't control that when you made it by hand. Now they're all made in factories. They're all the same caliber. All the bullets are the same size. So the first reason that war was so bad is because here's when we just got better at killing each other. Yeah. The second reason is because medical science couldn't begin to keep up with the Industrial Revolution. Now, at the time of that war, we had a road parallel to the river. Here's what we did in the winter time. We formed a wagon train, drive these wagons up north. They were designed when you got so far, we disassembled them, reassembled them in the river like a big Lego barge. See, in the winter, we're collecting all the free floating ice, we can pile up on the barge, float it downstream, and then store it in the ice house that originally stood there, which was, of course, insulated with things like sawdust, straw, of course, anything. We're a port city, which makes us kind of strong. The North did not like that, so it's a collaborative effort. When General Butler brings troops from the North, Captain Farragut brought ships from the South, we're locked in by the Union. So you better believe they bring their wounded better place to put their wounded than an ice house. They converted to a hospital. Have you figured out why the bodies are in the photo now? Yeah, amputate a limb, chuck it through the window to the room of the ice. They kept the smell down. So after you built up enough pieces and parts and entire cadavers, they simply brought them out here, stacked them from the sidewalks like they're old newspapers, and they'll eventually come out with wagons. Take these things away, one load at a time. Now, for this one, imagine you're a 15 year old soldier, you're on the battlefield, wham! Just got shot in the thigh. And I'm going to start with my very favorite scene. See, sometimes the powder brain is so low. That bullet, however, is still traveling fast enough to penetrate your flesh. Not fast enough sometimes to go through the wool fabric of your uniform. Now, if I'm 15 years old and I get shot, battlefield. It's probably the first time in my life I've been shot. I'm going to scream from a field surgeon. But a lot of the veterans have been through that enough would understand. Oh, hang on a second. Let's just see if I can stretch out my pants leg and pop that bullet out. It was rare. It was known to happen. That's why I want to share it. Let's make this more realistic, shall we? Say that bullet just shattered your femur. Now you want a doctor. Okay. <laughs> doctor applies a tourniquet here. Cuts your leg off right there where it hit the bone. Let's make this more interesting. Maybe you got shot in the ankle, or just below the knee. The doctor applies a tourniquet here, cuts your leg off in the same damn place. Not fair? No, it's not fair. I like to have most of my stuff too. We got a problem. A lot of wounded in this city, we gotta work fast. That's two bones, that's one. It's a lot easier. And these kids were lucky. We got something like, oh, opium, cocoa leaves, laudanum. Those are the favorite painkillers back then. I miss those things. But we didn't have access to that. Just got to go. Come on, kid. Come on. If you won't pass out, they're ready for that, too. See, the doctor often has a wooden mouth. What? And if he doesn't come out of that with a concussion, he's cold, right? Sometimes we wouldn't worry about that. The doctor then says, okay, son, bite down on this. They show a stick or a twisted piece of leather in his mouth. He is still conscious. This is a man in each arm holding him down. They put a belt on his leg, cut off the blood flow. Now, in the operation, first tool he picks up. This one's called the Mr. Knife. It's a long, slender blade. Its sole function is to go through a lot of meat quickly. They were known to go right down to the femur one time around. Razor sharp, sit down, pick up the bone saw. That fast, now at this point, there's an assistant. Somebody that can pull the leg out of the way for him. That left him nothing else to concentrate on. Setting down the bone saw, and then quickly but carefully grabbing the red hot frying pan. Sends that back to the You're not done. There is no way you can cauterize the femoral artery. It's about that big and it will definitely bleed to death in a minute. You have to move to the side, a lot of segment of that, stitch it close. So we apply a salve, bandage, luxon. Next. The next kid on this table was getting the same unsterilized enemies. 
same bowl of lukewarm water this doctor might have been washing his hands off in. And uh, well, even if it was, it had his blood. Everybody else in there for him. You didn't forget the frying pan, did you? <laughs> they have Teflon back then. Cast iron. So now imagine all those little bits of infected flesh stuck on them. This past on the station. Yet the leading cause of death in the Civil War is infection. Not the newfangled weapons they just came out with. That's why one of the best hauntings you're gonna get here. Clunk. Clunk. Because a lot of these kids were inheriting peg legs a little too soon. The wound had not healed. So the leather cup in that stick irritates the stump, and gangrene sets in very, very quickly. There are two types of gangrene, by the way. There's dry and there's wet. If this ever happens to you, pray you get the dry kind, because they allow this to scab up the leg they can rescue later underneath them. The wet kind today is hardly treated as it was during the Civil War, aside from the antibiotics. Think of this one like a Thanksgiving ham. But all they're doing is shaving it off. Shaving it off. Shaving it off. They're hoping the next time they have to make this cut they've got beyond the infection, they can't go any further. And trust me, you can shout right here. You don't want to go any further. <laughs> don't have it. All right, guys, hold that in mind. Five years ago, during a Mardi Gras, there's a man staying in this hotel. Wakes up at the sound of somebody else in his room. The person he sees is wearing a leather apron, mask, saw one hand, tourniquet in the other. Okay, did you notice this little grin that came over my face right here? I can't suppress this, but I haven't time to film this. See, this is my favorite haunting. Because when he walks to the room, he's wiping off the saw with the tourniquet. Here's why it's my favorite. I know it is incredibly rare to see an apparition and have me clear enough that you can discern the time period they're from if you can make note of the detail in the fashion, especially if you can. I don't know how rare it would be to see an apparition that's exhibiting the unsanitary conditions of that era. That's why I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> Thanks for allowing my little uh, Egon. <laughs> now, I can put myself in this guy's shoes quite easily. If something scares the crap out of me when I'm staying at a French Quarter Hotel, before I leave, I'm grabbing my pants. Everything I need right there. Keys, wallet, cell phone, go. This guy did nothing different. Now, five years ago during a Mardi Gras, how many vacancies do you think we had? None. It's good here. He's forced to drive 40 miles out to Slidell, found one, must accept it. Can't come back here for the rest of his things. Can't bring himself to do it. But he calls them to pack up everything that's left and FedEx it to the hotel pool. Is that rabbit? And it was the family, the family of five. Okay, they're done partying out on Bourbon Street. They come back ready to crash <laughs> in their room, pull back the fence, road. Oh, whoa, see, she was spattered with blood. Okay, I told you the Plast Arms people have been working there for years. Same thing here. Here, there is actually an isolated group of characters. They enjoy using moments like this to amuse themselves. They know when they take you back to your room, it's all going to be clean. It's back to normal every time. But what they do to get you there is sometimes hold you by the hand because they're actually trying to calm you and console you on the way back. This calming and consoling is often done more with uh, eye contact, but this is where that confidence they exude is going to go from confidence, 180 degrees, full tilt boogie to confidence. They know the layout of this place much better than you. There is no need for them to break the eye contact. They can just saddle up to your bed without looking, reach over and pick up the sheets. This is where the switch comes in. Hold them up. It's almost as if they're acting like they have a talk with you when they say, nothing here, nothing here, and they're clean, every single time. You can see, this is why I enjoy telling people when you have in-laws, relatives, you just can't stand, send them to the 